thanks, Ken. Thanks for thanks for having me. Really pleased to be here. I think it's such a great idea to have these online talks, an opportunity for us to connect with other wildlife lovers and, and do it in this novel way via Zoom. So really excited to be involved. Um, uh, yeah, so thought I'd just introduce myself. Uh, as Ken said, I'm, I'm Hannah. I do work for the Bat Conservation Trust. I've been there since 2015. I actually work for the National Bat Helpline, where they're part of the trust that are there to answer sort of any and every question that members of the public have about bats. We're the first port of call that people get through when they try and call us. Um, so I've been doing all kinds of jobs for them since 2015. I now manage that helpline team. But I am also involved in the London Bat Group and I have been for several years. Um, various roles there as well. I've been on the committee at points. I've been a trustee at points. I've been a trainee volunteer bat worker myself. And at one point I was even the co-chair of London Bat Group. Um, I've stepped back a little bit for personal reasons, um, some conflicting demands on my time, uh, but still very much involved in, in London Bats and do as much as I can to help London Bats and enjoy them as much as I can as well. So um, just before I start talking about the Bats as well, I have to say, if, um, if there's any sort of background noise, I have to apologise for that. I'm sharing a workspace with my partner and he's sort of dipping in and out and taking meetings and next door I've just started doing some hammering or some kind of DIY I don't know so I'm very sorry if you hear any background noise I hope that you can still hear what I'm saying we'll see so I thought I'd just tell you about where it all started for me why where I got into bats and why I started loving them um I, I graduated from university in 2013 I did a degree in biology not really sure what I wanted to do with that just quite liked science quite liked nature um quite like watching David Attenborough documentaries and thought oh that seems like something I, I like um, so I actually started volunteering for the local wildlife trust when I got out of university and that spent that meant spending a lot of my time in a south London woodland um, it's Sydenham Hill Wood not sure if anyone knows it it's obviously in Sydenham but it's a beautiful little nature reserve um, hidden away in a very urban area um, that's got absolutely lots lots of nature in it it's got pockets of ancient woodland with very ancient trees it's got meadows there's unmanaged pockets and pockets that have sort of uh, had coppicing done or had fences built you know some very managed areas uh, all for the enjoyment of london the london's people and for wildlife so absolutely loved that spent a lot of my time getting really muddy chopping down trees having a great time but part of my favorite role there as a volunteer was the um the surveys that we did so we would do butterfly surveys we would do moth trapping at night um all kinds of things but at one point we did also do some bat box checks so in Sydney Hall Wood there's uh, I think around 50 bat boxes hopefully you can see on the picture on the right hand side there um they're, they're erected into trees and dotted all around the woodland um to encourage bats to have a place to sleep um so one day a member of the local bat group, London bat group, came round. Uh, she had all the appropriate licenses and experience and she'd run up those little ladders, open the lid from the bat box and see what was inside. And that was absolutely thrilling to me. Uh, we saw pipistrels, we saw Lysler's bats. Seeing bats up close was just amazing. I'd, I'd never had an opportunity like that. And as soon as I saw their little faces, I just fell in love. And so I was incredibly lucky. I, I got the chance to go up one of these ladders myself and pull out a bat. And we actually found a noctule, um, which is this picture here. He's a nice chunky bat. And I like him. He's got lovely ginger hair, which if I had my camera on on Zoom, you might see that I can relate to that. Um, a grumpy little fella. Um, but look at that sweet little face. I just, I just fell in love. Um, and it was really special. I didn't even realise how special at the time, but it was the first record that they had had at that site of a noctual actually roosting in the wood. They'd had uh, records of bats, uh, noctual bats flying over, but this was really special because we knew that they were actually living here in the woods. So from that moment on, basically I was hooked. Um, what I found is that the more you get interested in bats the more you realize there is to learn there is just so much still that we don't know about bats there is so much that's amazing about bats that I, I went I went down the rabbit hole and here I am many years later still in love with bats so um a few a few fun facts maybe you don't know I'm not sure but um some interesting things about bats they're the only true flying mammals they've evolved over millions of years in order to 
in order to fly like this you, you know you hear of other animals that glide but that's not true flight bats are the only mammals that have true flight which i think is incredible and as you can see in this picture on the right here um their wings are made up of membranes spread between their elongated finger bones so some people have said you know bats they really fly by the power of jazz hands which i find quite endearing <laughs> so they're the only true flying mammals and they're incredibly diverse because of it they you know they fly all over the place the only places on earth that there are no bats are the arctic and the antarctic and a few isolated oceanic islands so because of that they're also incredibly diverse in their ecology there's over 1400 species across the world and they you know they survive all different things some of them are in very extreme environments they've got very unique adaptations for hunting and roosting depending on where they are so some bats in the world might eat frogs some eat fruit some even eat other bats some have got specialized tongues that allow them to reach very deep into the uh, nectar of of large flowers so that they can eat the nectar uh, as you might know some bats eat blood um, some eat pollen or fish all of our bats here in the uk they eat insects and there are 17 breeding species in the uk interestingly all of our bats as well are very very small i feel that's possibly an overlooked uh, area about bats or something that not everybody unless you really like bats necessarily realizes um of course you can you know you see bats pictures of bats maybe flying foxes from across the world very very large but actually in the uk they're very very tiny and our smallest bat is about the size of your thumb and all of our bats use echolocation as well so an incredibly sophisticated mechanism that allows them to navigate dense woodlands or pick up even the tiniest midges as they fly by so what bats will do is release these calls at a high speed and frequency um, mostly above human hearing range and then they listen to those recalls those calls returning the calls bounce off of nearby objects be it a tree or a wall or an insect listen to those calls returning and that helps them create a mental picture of their environment so they're able to navigate incredibly dense woodland and as i say pick up very small insect prey even a midge so because of that they don't get stuck in your hair that myth always flies around with bats and possibly one of the reasons they get such a bad reputation in the media for example you know people think that bats are going to fly in your hair but they don't they're, they're incredibly sophisticated echolocation and actually really great eyesight as well so these are just some of some of the the few things about bats that just makes you think wow these are some amazing animals at this point you might be wondering what about covid19 that's been in the news a lot of course um I'm just going to say I'm not going to talk at length at all about COVID-19 in this talk but the Bat Conservation Trust website does have an amazing FAQ so I've got this little screen recording here which shows you where to find that if you are interested. Essentially the animal source of the virus that causes COVID-19 hasn't actually been confirmed. Um, it's quite possible that it has ancestral roots in bats but the reason that COVID-19 has turned into a global pandemic is because of transmission from humans to humans. So um, the media have made it seem in some cases that bats are really the problem here and some people have even called for culls of bats, mass culls of bats because of this pandemic but actually it's um, you know it's not the bats fault at all um, and the COVID-19 coronavirus or any uh, harmful to human coronaviruses haven't been isolated in any of our UK bats. So they're really not dangerous and there should be nothing to stop us from going out and enjoying our bats as we always have. So as I say, I'm, I'm not an expert on COVID-19. The Bat Conservation Trust has amazing resources. There's a fantastic FAQ there that answers any question you can imagine about COVID-19. So I very much encourage you to have a look there if you are interested. So what's the year in the life of a bat like? I thought I'd start spring, summer, where we are now. All of the insects have come out flying around plenty of food for bats as i said they all eat insects so bats are waking up they're very busy they've got lots to eat they'll be replenishing their fat store that they might have lost over winter um, and the female uh, bats will start to have their babies as well so typically bats in the uk they only have one baby a year 
called a pup and they're born naked. Um, this one in the pictures, uh, maybe a couple of days old, they're usually born sort of completely pink and bald. And then they start to grow this uh, very short gray suede fur and it gets a bit velvety. And then after a couple of months, there'll be a nice furry adult like you can see in the pictures behind. Um, so bats are, baby bats start getting born typically around June-ish. Um, so people might find baby bats in June, July or August if they've accidentally been separated from mum. And they're very, very vulnerable at this time. They suckle milk from mum like most mammals do. Um, so very heavily reliant on on mum looking after them and actually the mother will carry around the bat the baby for a good few weeks until it gets too heavy to carry any longer mothers tend to congregate in larger groups as well um, so that might be something we call a maternity roost where lots of females from the local population they get together they each have their one baby and that way the baby has got somewhere safe and warm to live in the evenings when the mother goes out to hunt for insects and get water and that sort of thing she'll come back and you know if she's not carrying the baby at this point she'll come back throughout the night so that the baby has a chance to suckle and they spend a lot of their time in these roosts socializing very social animals they're chatting all the time uh grooming very clean animals and they spend a lot of their time grooming and some research into not a bat found in the uk but uh, a different a different species of bat they analyzed the social calls of the uh, egyptian fruit bat and found that most of the time they spend their time arguing about where the best place in the roost is to be and that kind of thing, which I think is quite fun because you can imagine that if there's hundreds of bats all in one space in the, in the summer and getting a little bit grumpy and arguing with each other. But that makes me laugh. So throughout the summer, the bats are spending their time out being bats, raising their young, and then by the time autumn comes around, things change a little bit. Autumn is actually the time of year when bats mate. So... When, when they've um, left their maternity roosts and they're looking for somewhere else to go throughout the autumn and winter, they'll spend some time mating and then they will use the drop in temperature to match their, their bodies to the ambient temperature of that. So essentially all of their insect food dies away over the autumn, much fewer insects around for them to eat. So it's very energy expensive for them to be out and about trying to hunt for insects that aren't there so actually they spend a lot of their time sleeping in something called torpor it's a little bit like this how cute are those so as i say they, they drop their body temperature to the to the ambient temperature which is much lower um, their heartbeat slows way way down and they save energy while little insect food is available and then come winter time the torpor is even more extended to the point where it's almost hibernation in the spring is when they wake up again fully um, and when the when the conditions are suitable they'll actually self-fertilize so they'll have mated in the autumn wait till spring and then think right great weather's good insects are out time to be about again then they'll self-fertilize and have their babies later in the spring so just a little about about a little bit about the bats that live in london so we've got a fair few species here. I'll just talk about a couple. Uh, one of my favorites is the brown long-eared bat. As you can see in the right-hand photo here, their characteristic huge ears. Um, the ears are actually incredibly important for them for hunting. So these bats have very, very quiet echolocation calls, which means that they need these great big ears so that they can hear those very faint calls coming back to them. Sometimes they're even called whispering bats. So the, the photo on the right shows you a brown long-eared and a grey long-eared. There are two long-eared species in the UK, but the grey long-eareds are incredibly, incredibly rare. We actually don't get those in London. They are down in the south coast, the southwest. Um, it's thought that there's possibly only about a thousand long-eareds left and just a handful of maternity roosts that we know about, so incredibly rare. But the brown long-eareds are a little bit more widespread, a little bit more common. So yeah, they've got these very quiet echolocation calls, which makes them very stealthy so that the insects don't hear them coming. Um, and most importantly, they're adorable. Look at those little ears, or should I say long ears. In London, we also get all three of our pipistrelle species. So it was only about the 90s that we realized, I say we, I wasn't there, um, that bat workers realized that there, there are three different species of pipistrelles in the UK. So we have common, soprano, 
and the Nethesius pipistrels. These are our smallest bats in the UK. They weigh only a few grams. As I mentioned earlier, some of our bats in the UK are about the size of your thumb. Um, that's the pipistrels. And they weigh just about the same size as an A4 piece of paper, incredibly tiny and very, very sweet. Uh, the Nethusius pipistrelle is a particularly special bat because they actually, as well as breeding here in the UK, they actually migrate from mainland Europe. And the London Bat Group are involved in something called the Nethusius pipistrelle project, which helps us understand how these bats are moving. So what this means is that members of the London Bat Group will go out on uh, nice spring and autumn evenings. They'll set up something called a harp trap, which you can see in the left-hand picture here. They'll hide it among the vegetation so that the bats are able to fly between the poles here. And then in between these poles are very, very fine strings um, that the bats fly into and then fall down into the trap down here. It's only temporary. We're not trying to keep them or anything. It's just so that we can, we can monitor the bats. So, um, very enthusiastic members of the London Bat Group will go over to the traps, check them every few minutes and get really excited when we see, see some in the traps. Um, my favourite part is seeing their little legs and their little bums. I just think that's so cute. Uh, it get, it's very exciting every time there's a bat in a trap. We will pull them out and process them, ident identify them. Um, you can use as part of this project uh, acoustic lures so that we, we try to get just Nethusius pipistrels, but we do uh, inevitably pick up some other species as well. So when they come out, we'll try and find out what species have we got here and gather some information about them. Um, we might do that based on their facial features. So it's possible to tell the difference between different bat species based on what their faces look like, as well as their ear shape and size, their feet shape and size, and some key measurements like their forearm length and thumb length and that sort of thing. So on the left hand picture here you can see somebody trying to work out the venation of the wings and um, that can sometimes be an identification indicator. Um, different pipistrelle species tend, I should say, tend to have different venation in their wings. It helps you work out which is which. And on the right there we're using a caliper to, to measure the forearm of the bat. On the left it's just another another picture of looking at the on the wing venation and you can see those amazing long finger bones and hopefully some of the bats will be catching on enthusiast pipistrels like the one on the right there so these are a little bit bigger than the common and soprano pipistrels and in my opinion tend to be a little bit grumpier um, maybe it's the long journey from over over from europe that puts them in a grump i don't blame them at all um, so you can have a look on the Bat Conservation Trust website if you're interested to find out where in Europe bats are coming from. Uh, but in London in 2017, two bats from Latvia turned up in August and September. So the minimum distance that those bats must have travelled for migration is over 1,400 kilometres, which for a bat this size is absolutely incredible. So that's a special mention for the Nethusius pipistrels. Some of the other bats we get in London, of course, the noctule. As you've already seen, my favourite. Uh, they are one of the largest bats that we've got in the UK. Um, if you can remember back to that photo at the beginning of the uh, presentation, they're a bit bigger than your thumb. So if you put the nose of the bat on your forefinger, their tail would run to about your, your pinky finger. So they're about you know the width of your hand. They emerge a little bit earlier and you can usually tell if you're looking at a noctule because they fly very high above treetop level and they can see be seen steeply diving for insects. So if you're out quite early at dusk and you see very, very high flying larger bats, uh, it could well be a noctule. Uh, they eat midges and then later in the year they specialise more on, on beetles and moths and they can actually fly over 10 kilometres from their roost space where they live to their feeding ground, which is a, again a, a very long distance for a little bat like that. And these bats are usually found in trees. Uh, we do also have Dool Benton's bats here in London. Um, another, another firm favourite. You might notice that these bats have got very large feet compared to their body size. This is because they use their feet to, uh, to, to hunt, essentially. These bats you'll see foraging over water. They'll pick up insects either from the, the water's surface or very close to the water's surface. 
they'll fly over and then use those enormous feet to grab the insects and then they'll actually use their tail to sort of scoop the insects up and direct them towards their mouths. So these can be a little bit harder to see out and about if you're um, near a, a large body of water, maybe a lake or a pond. Um, just before dusk you might spot some doorbentons, but uh, unless there's some kind of lighting, they can be very difficult to see because of course the water is dark and the uh, you know vegetation around it is quite dark and the bats look dark. So um, they can be a little bit more difficult to see, but you definitely can if you try. So I have to mention why bats need our help. The Bat Conservation Trust exists for a reason. You know, we're here to protect bats because they need it. And there's several reasons really. Bats have seen huge population declines over the last century. Um, this is partially because of loss of habitat. So uh, bats that like to roost in trees and caves and other natural features, they're, they're losing a lot of those sorts of natural spaces. Intensified agricultural practices could also be a contributing factor. So for example, the use of pesticides uh, controlling insect numbers and diversity uh, can reduce the amount of food available for, for bat species. Bats are actually an amazing natural pest controller because of the volume and diversity of insects that they eat. Many of those insects do feed on, you know, crops. And then, you know, urbanization, moving into natural habitats where bats would like to be living and we're building buildings on top of them instead. They're losing a lot of their roosts, but we're also putting in a lot of artificial lighting for developments and streets and lighting in all kinds of places that we might not even need lighting. Bats are nocturnal, they come out at night, they're, they're very uh, well adapted to navigating at, in low light conditions. And so introducing new artificial light sources can be very, very damaging for bats and their populations. It might actually prevent bats from wanting to emerge from their roost at all if there's new lighting put in because they're, you know, they're not seeing that it's dark and it's safe for them to leave. Um, being in well-lit areas puts them at much higher risk of predation. And it might prevent them from moving between their usual habitat grounds, uh, sorry, their usual sort of roosting ground and feeding ground, for example. So as I mentioned, some of our bats, they, they, tr they can travel kilometers between where they live and where they eat. And they need nice dark skies in order to do that. And if we're lighting those dark skies, they're, they're getting sort of pocketed into to smaller areas with, with fewer food resources available to them. And then a sad but a true reason why um, bats need our help is that they, they often get a bad reputation um, for all kinds of reasons, usually based on myths that just aren't true. You know, people think that bats are going to give you diseases or get stuck in your hair or if they roost in your house they might cause a lot of damage and a lot of the time just it's not based in fact. So we do have the National Bat Helpline there at the Bat Conservation Trust which a lot of our role is to help people understand better why bats are so important, why they're such great house guests when they do decide to roost in our buildings and what we can do to protect them. There's really no reason to be afraid of bats, in fact there's so many reasons to celebrate bats. So you might be thinking, well, what can I do to help then if they're, in, if they're in such decline and they need our help? Um, there's, there's so many ways that you can get involved. The great thing about bat conservation is that there's really any sort of any people can get involved in any way they like. You don't even need to leave the house. Um, one method you might like to explore is to provide a bed for the bats. So um, when I say bed, I mean, I mean a place for them to sleep, a bat box. There's lots of different different designs out there. You can buy them readily made online. You can even make your own bat boxes. It, generally speaking, it helps to put them about four meters off of the ground so that the bats have got a nice space below the bat box to sort of swoop down when they fly out of their box. Um, they are likely to use the bats around the summer months and in the summer the bats, because they match their body temperatures to the ambient temperatures, they like to keep nice and warm. So putting a bat box on a south facing aspect of your house or the tree or the shed or wherever you have available to you is a good idea. Um, and actually placing multiple if you can. So facing southwest, facing southeast as well. Ideally the boxes would be situated near trees or hedges somewhere that creates a little bit of cover for them so that when they emerge from their boxes they can sort of go off into the vegetation without uh, being at risk of predation. Um, and of course, as I say, watch out for lighting. If you've got a, a, spa a space on your wall that might be good for a bat box, but it's right below your uh, security light, it might not be the best place. So bats don't like to be 
uh, around lighting. So once you've provided your bed, the bats are going to need breakfast. So there's plenty of ways that you can encourage insect food, either around your garden or your home or in your sort of local area if you're involved in any sort of natural reserves or anything like that. So it's a good idea to plant flowering plants um, and it's good to think about the, the which plants you're choosing. So they'll want to be flowering but you'll want a diversity of plants so that they flower right from the beginning of spring and then different plants take over and keep flowering right until the end of autumn. The reason for that is because insects are attracted to these flowering plants. So the more insects you get the more likely you are to get bats. So in order to attract a variety of insects that are going to help the bats uh, also think about the types of flowers that you've got. Some are very um, short and will attract insects with shorter sort of tongues or whatever they use to suck up the nectar and some of the flowers are very long so you can see the difference in the top here which I want to say is honeysuckle I might be wrong and a very short flower there they're going to have different insects attracted to them. Paler flowers attract dusk flying insects which is great of course for bats. Avoiding pesticides so that insects can can come and thrive. And also, you know, it might not just be about flowering, but log piles, compost, insect hotels, anything that you can do to encourage invertebrates into your local green space or garden will, will be great. Bats, like any other animal, they do need access to water. Providing a pond or um, fighting for the appropriate management of your local marsh or uh, even a bird bath. Water is very important for bats, not only for drinking, but because some of their insect feed will spend some of their lifestyle, uh, life cycle in water. So it's a great source for water and food for bats. What else can you do? You can volunteer. So there's lots and lots of volunteer opportunities available. London Bat Group are... Um, they're a, a small voluntary organisation. All of the members are volunteers. And there's lots of ways you can get involved. You might be going to events and talking to the public about why bats are so great. You might be helping run events where people are making bat boxes. You might be helping on nas national surveys, like an enthusiast pipistrelle survey, or uh, you know, volunteering for the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Lots and lots of ways that you can get involved. Um, enjoying your local bats. I think is a very important way to to help them you know the more you go out and and experience these bats flying around you take yourself to the local park or garden wherever it's safe for you to go around dusk and just enjoy these bats flying out from trees foraging over water flying around your head it just reignites this sort of love and excitement around bats that you can appreciate how amazing they are and then you can go off and tell all your friends and family what a wonderful experience you've had why bats are so special, how much you've enjoyed them, and maybe they'll do the same. And of course, there's lots of sort of financial ways you can support the work of bat conservation. So donations and membership are often very, very important for all charities, but particularly the Bat Conservation Trust and the London Bat Group. So if you can afford it, do consider making a donation or even becoming a member to one of those organisations. So that's it. That was just a very quick whistle-stop tour, why I love bats, and hopefully give you some um, food for thought for why you should love them too. That was great. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, that was, I even picked up a few new things there and uh, I've been involved in bat work since, oh goodness, uh, that's in 99, 2000. So um, it's always <laughs> great hearing other bat enthusiasts talk about them because you always learn new things as you go along. So um, yeah, so th this is the time to ask questions. Um, one I would like to double check with you, Hannah, because my experience of this is almost 20 years ago. But um, Emma asked, would bats have been positively or negatively affected by the heat wave we had in 2018? Um, so you might have more up to date information on that. But the one I experienced nearly 20 years ago, we found that um, lots of the, the females gave up nursing their young. And uh, so you kind of lost a generation that year. Um, just to save themselves but yeah any thoughts on that that's a really really great question yeah um, sorry ken i don't know if you've got your sound on but i could hear a little bit of audio play back then Joe, okay I could hear that um sorry yeah great question uh i don't think that we'll likely have the information that we need as part of the monitoring that the back conservation trusts do to to say for sure anything about that yet 
Um, but I think you're probably right, Ken, that it, it's likely that the heat heat waves will have some impact on on bats because of their the way their behaviour has to change throughout the summer to re, to respond to that. So, for example, in um, the summer, these maternity roosts of the mothers and their young, they like to go to nice warm roosts that might be in houses or you know other natural features. Um, but they they want to stay warm because that helps keep their babies warm and they're very active. But if they are in an area that's um, you know under the roof tiles of a house for example and then we go through a, a very severe heat wave and it gets very very hot there they might have to relocate and if that happens just at the time of year where they're no longer carrying their babies but um the babies are not you know good enough flyers themselves yet that could have really big problems um and yeah I, I, i'm not an expert in this sort of thing have to say but i have heard of bats having to you know um leave babies because of unfavorable conditions or uh you know not not carry through with pregnancies because of unfavorable conditions so um i'm sure somebody can answer that question much better than i can but i could i can imagine that it's, it's possible that heat waves would have an impact yes but um i don't have any data to back that up <laughs> i'm afraid <laughs> Uh, that, that's great thank you Hannah um, someone had to run off early so I just want to read their comment they've said thank you very much I have a meeting so I've had to run off early but this was lovely thank you to yourselves and Hannah oh, they good. will check out um, the website this evening because while you were talking at different points I was creating links to different pages on the Bat Conservation Trust website so yes. they've wished you a good weekend um, what else have we got here yeah Emma, Emma's question around the heat wave was um, she thanked you for the answer but she wasn't sure if it might have anything to do with insects and kind of how insects might be affected in kind of hot, dry conditions. And so... Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. It's, yeah. That's very possible, but unfortunately I don't know the answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of the, it's so many things that need looking at, aren't, don't, don't they, when you've kind of got those conditions. Yeah. Um, we do have one C19 question I'm happy to read it out but it, it might be better to kind of refer back to the details on the Bat Conservation Trust website and this was kind of linked to what you were saying at the beginning about people suggesting to cull bats and things and um, they're, they're concerned that there might be caught similar calls to that here but mm -hmm. um, yeah I don't know whether you want to say anything more on that Hannah. Well what I will say is that culling the bats Culling any bats is definitely not the answer to controlling global pandemics. That's that's not what's going to work. The reason that um, viruses are able to jump between species is because of the way that humans are interacting with nature. So where we're becoming a much closer proximity with nature and um, you know manipulating nature in a way that animals are in very close proximity and in very stressed environments that might allow uh, diseases to jump species much easier. That's, that's the reason for, for uh, these viruses jumping to humans. And then of course, there's the human to human reason that, that it's become a global pandemic. It, you know, bats didn't create this number of COVID-19 cases in humans. It was the human to human transition. Mm -hmm. So actually the best thing that we can do in terms of bats is to keep protecting bats, keep protecting their natural roosting locations, uh, keep fighting for their conservation. Um, yeah, so that, that's all I'll say about that, but um, do have a look at the FAQ on the website. Yeah, I, I was reading um, a really, I can't remember I saw the article, but um, it was an article about bats and their resistance to viruses because they live in such large colonies and in close proximity to each other. So, um, you know, this was an, uh, just a nice article about bats and kind of their, their strength as a species. And um, partly that is they're being able to resist lots of viruses through their um, close ways of living together. But anyway, that's, that's just, I can't remember all the article, but that was something just stuck in my mind there. And um, we've got a question here about self-fertilise. So they, they're kind of two of the same things. So we've got kind of, um, you said they self-fertilise. Some animals mate with several males and later choose which one to use to self-fertilise. Do bats do that? And um, and then someone asking how the self-fertilisation actually works. I'm afraid I have to admit to both of those questions, I don't actually know the answer. As I said earlier, there's <laughs> so much to know about bats. I, I, I don't know it all. 
by any stretch of the imagination but there will be answers out there people probably will know this this answers so i'm sorry i'll have to i have to direct you to do a bit of um independent research on that one i'm afraid um or ken i don't i don't know what follow-up you do after these but i can always find out answers and send them through to you to share yeah yeah, we we can we can email people in the group so if you if you're able and happy to do that honey yeah we can um give everyone an answer separately uh, yeah yeah i'll do i'll do that Uh, avoid um saying something that's not quite right (laughs) yes exactly um and then we've got another one about are bats affected by loud noise they have a railway run along their garden and um but other and it's kind of very wildlife friendly their garden i think they're trying to tell me there they can be um i think when uh, you know when you consider noise disruption it's when it's a new noise to a existing roosting location so for example if um you had a bat roost in your house and you didn't know it was there and then you started doing some building work which created a lot of noise or vibration that could disturb the points to you know to make them leave the roost in even in the daylight um but i think people would be surprised by how much bats can tolerate in terms of noise near a roost um you've heard the saying bats in the belfry uh, bats do live in belfries in churches where where bells ring and are incredibly loud so to some extent um you know i, d- I don't know what they do to protect themselves from that noise but they could put up with a little bit and i have seen bats roosting under uh, bridges for example like road bridges that are very very busy uh, cars and lorries and all sorts going over at all times of the day and night and um, bats will happily live under there so i think you know uh, they're put up with a surprising amount of noise but it's that sort of previously quiet roost location and then all of a sudden this brand new noise that might uh, they might not be able to tolerate as well yeah. and then uh, we've got geraldine said i think they've been monitoring bats in the olympic park do you know anything about that? There is a wonderful Twitter account you can follow, isn't there, to do with this? But do you know more about it? I, I know very limited information about it. But yes, they have been. And it's very exciting. They're using, um, they've got sort of static detectors that allow them to pick up the audio calls of bats flying over. And so they've got these amazing, um, amazing pool of information about how bats are using that space. I think that was uh, UCL, University College London, project and the London Bat Group and Bat Conservation Trust have been involved to some extent in that. Uh, I've not been so I can't tell you much more than that but uh, yes there's definitely bats there and they're doing a lot of work to monitor them. Uh, yeah and I, said, I can't remember the Twitter account off the top of my head but there is one and um, you get kind of daily reports. Every, yeah. Most days. You get the, what, how many bat passes they've recorded and where in the Olympic Park so yeah it's really, it's really good. Um, and then Lydia, who kind of asked the C19 question, kind of just added a bit more to it. She goes, sorry, that was meant to be more a question as to whether it created a conservation issue in the UK um, or personal experiences of those working with bats. Certainly didn't want to suggest there might be any value in the call for coals. Oh, no. <laughs> no. So. I hadn't imagined she'd suggested that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, we, have, we have had people say these sorts of things. On the helpline, as I say, we are the first port of call for any kind of bat um, question or concern or query that members of the public have and we have seen a rise in p- people's concerns about bats and COVID-19 and, and lots of people who have had bat roost sometimes even for decades or many years and then all of a sudden see these news stories it's, you know sometimes quite misleading news stories in the media and think oh gosh I'm at risk here in my home mm. um, a lot of the time we're able to sort of correct that and say you know here's the information there's no need for you to worry it's very very possible for you to live happily alongside each other um although it's it's difficult to know for sure the full extent to which this has changed public attitude on bats because we might not we might not hear from everybody you know who think differently or who want to get rid of their bats and maybe don't even think to seek advice or or don't know that we're here for advice so uh yes yeah, so we definitely had an increase in these sorts of negative inquiries into the helpline uh, which we're you know we're very happy to deal with we're talk to anybody until the cows come home about bats so that's no problem for us but um yeah there's a lot of work to be done now in in changing the hearts and minds of of the public about about bats and their value for us and their importance and yeah for why sure. we don't need to be worried and the, and then um i think it was stephanie was asking the question about self-fertilization she said she'll she'll happily find out the information independently and she's thanked you for the great information and she's going to join the cambridge back group so oh, yay, join your local back group 
Yes. There's like over 100 of them in the UK and they're all really, really good. Um, and yeah. and yeah. then someone just asking when we do get that information about self-isolation. Yes, we'll email it to everyone who's attended today's talk. So you can all get that to read. Another one, Sally saying, thank you. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> like that. I've never had this a good question. How do bats know what a bat box is? E.g. distinguish it from a bird box and other way round, birds, bats, you know. So, well, that's um, a really great question. It is, it is good, isn't it? I've never had that before. I like it. <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy the mind. One way round is really easy because I'll tell you for nothing, birds love using bat boxes. <laughs> yeah. So I think what they're probably, birds and bats alike, are looking for are just uh, suitable cracks and crevices and they don't know that it's a box they just know that it's a, a suitable place it's sheltered it's you know free of drafts and moisture and it's got a good stable temperature um because it the bat boxes typically are designed to mimic uh, natural features in caves or trees so for example in a very old tree bats might even roost between the cracks between the tree and where old bark has lifted off and so some bat boxes will have lots of cavities inside, which gives them a really narrow gap that the bats like to squeeze into. They like having something, in, you know, all the way down their front and all the way down their back. They like to be squashed in. So um, I think they probably just come across it and think, oh, look, that looks quite nice. I fit my little bat body in there and then they go in. But, um, but birds love using bat boxes and it's a little bit of a nuisance sometimes. Um, usually the ones that have got somewhere for the bird to land they'll use um there are some designs that are made so that it's much harder for birds to use them um so a good tip is to pop a bird box next to the bat box and then hopefully everyone plays nice and the birds use the bird boxes and the bats use the bat boxes i don't i've not heard many stories of bats using bird boxes i think that's probably because of their design usually uh, i'm picturing like a typical bird box like that little wooden house with a circular hole in the middle um, might not be so suitable for bats because they uh, land and then crawl into their uh, roost entrance. So on a bat box that tends to be at the bottom, like a small slit at the bottom so that they can land on a on a board below and, and climb up. Um, so I've not heard so much of it happening the other way around. But we, yeah, we get a lot of nests in bird bo uh, bat boxes. And then Jill said um, she thinks there might be bat boxes just outside Stratford Station. Um, can you and, and she says can can you see them from the jubilee line i didn't know about that i don't know whether you do hannah no i don't know about those ones um i want because that's not too far from the olympic park is it no no it can, stratford station kind of feeds the olympic park so um yeah yeah, uh, I, I, yeah something i'll look out for yeah it, it might be that there's you know was some local development near to there and they had to put up bat boxes mm. as part of that you know to encourage bats or because they were removing some space that the bats were using before but i don't know um it's quite a fun game spot the bat box when you go mm. for a walk especially in, in like woodlands and parks and that sort of thing yeah, grab a grab a picture jill um, and show it to me next time we bump into each other um and then sally's asked which bits bats um, live in the cemetery park uh, we haven't spoke about that we've not discovered any roosts in the cemetery park um we have only recorded them hunting here. So we've recorded pipistrels, um, both the common and soprano. I'm pretty much, we've had enthusiasts through here and nocturnal flyovers, you know, very quick and just a quick blast on the bat detector and gone. Um, but yeah, it tends to be pipistrels that we'll, we'll see, common pipistrels primarily when we do our bat walks. And uh, yeah, they're always, I'm always very happy to see them because it's nice to know that wherever they are roosting is still good for them. Mm -hmm. They're still coming to the cemetery park to hunt. But yeah, they, they can, um, there must be a more local roost because in the last few years we've started to see them very early um, as the sun sets. So rather than kind of 20 minutes or something after sunset, which might imply they're traveling to us from elsewhere. Um, but yeah, one of the better bat walks we did was actually in Sweden Ball Gardens last summer. I was actually doing the introduction of a bat at the bat talk, and in the sun, it was still very sunny, and there was a bat flying over the playground. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, so everyone got a really good view of that. It was still very light out. Um, yeah, brilliant. Anyway, that's that's all I can say on that. So someone thanking you for their answer, and they're going to put a bat box up on. Oh, we've lost it on top of their cherry tree. Okay. Um, so, oh yeah. So I think um, Andy's asking about. I think he might be asking about you know the impact of kind of the virus on us doing things and walks and talks. 
So yeah, this is why we're doing it this way, Andy. I think if I'm understanding your question correctly. That one be go on. Oh, you keep cutting out, Andy. I didn't quite catch that question. Sorry. Say it again. I was wondering about like when you start going back and doing things again at the cemetery and how it'll affect the way you do things with teaching people about bats and that and how this will affect like the work you do with them and that. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, the main thing with us is probably with all nature reserves and parks is we don't have the volunteers helping. So everything's been done a bit more crudely, um, more with machinery than kind of gloved hands and hand tools. Um, but yeah, we can't really work with volunteers at the moment. But everything that we do in the Sandwich Park is to encourage wildlife, so um, which benefits bats in the long run. So I, hopefully that answers your question, Andy. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I feel I did not answer it. Um, oh goodness! Wow, we I've never I've never seen this before. Here's one for you, Hannah. Um, Tara saw a listing on Etsy for baby bats. What is the law around that? Oh gosh, that's yeah. not good. And if yeah. they're UK bats, super illegal. Yeah. Um, all bats in the UK are protected by law, so it's illegal to not only sort of disturb bats in their roost or damage or disturb their roost, but possess a bat. Um, some bat workers might get a specific license from Natural England, our statutory nature conservation organisation here in England, to uh, hold on to bats for education purposes if they're not able to be released. But that's only if they're sort of injured bats that are, you know, unsuitable for release. The sort of sale of bats or keeping of UK bats as pets as pets is totally illegal. Um, I think that sort of in broad terms goes for any live bat uh, sorry wild bat in Europe and it kind of depends on how the species falls into other legislation like CITES for example um, whether bats can be held for taxidermy or um, like sold as pets varies but for sure UK species it's you're not allowed to do that um, and also some sites will advertise that um, the bats have been bred for resale if they're not UK bats because the laws are different in other areas of the world um, and that's not always necessarily the case is possibly a little bit of false advertising there so um, our, the, our advice is to never buy not I'm not saying that you're considering it but um, don't, don't buy bats online or don't buy taxidermy it's you, you know you can never really be sure of the source and how ethical or legal that source is so Thank you, Hannah. And Jenya has asked, are bats sensitive to air pollution? Oh, that's a very good question. I actually don't know the answer to that at all. Um, it's, hard, it's hard, isn't yeah, it? I mean, it's sure. probably in a similar way to how it affects humans. You know, that it's, I don't know whether it would affect their lung capacity and, you know, or affect the way they might fly if they've got limited lung capacity, if they're kind of born and bred in a city near air pollution, whether has effect on the development of the lungs all oh, really good 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 thoughts and yeah, yeah that's <laughs> something new to go and research now yeah there we go write a paper genuine here we go <laughs> <laughs> don't do a peer-reviewed paper um and then oh Susanna's uh, who my colleague has found something to do with bats on Etsy and um, asking Tara if this is the link she saw and it's actually a fake bat made of silicon so hopefully that is the one she saw which would be a a great relief um so that's kind of reached the oh, oh my goodness someone said it's 385 pound <laughs> my goodness um 385 pound exclamation exclamation so if anyone wants to turn their mic off and ask a question feel free otherwise we've reached the end of the questions in the chat um is there any last things you would like to say hannah no just just thanks for having me i'm, I'm pleased any opportunity I can get to come and natter on about bats um yeah I'd be interested to hear from uh, anybody if they've got any questions um maybe I can give you my email address Ken to add to the email that you sent yeah. around so yeah yeah feel free to get in touch. um and yeah I'd really encourage you all to consider joining your local bat groups the memberships for them are usually just a few quid a year um and a really really great way to learn more about your local bats and get involved so and we do need more East London based uh, um, people associated with the London Bat Group. I don't think there. I don't see a lot of London bat workers 
around this oh, I, I, I moved out of east london as well <laughs> yeah. i used to be in that in that little yeah. pocket so where is everybody but yeah, I, where I don't even know now so yeah so uh, yeah do join up for the east london ones um oh goodness there's some last few comments coming in here uh yeah they're just they're all talking about the silicon bat thing but thanks for a great talk thank you learned a lot they'll be joining the london bat group thanks very much that was great great talk um I live by Sweden Ball Gardens and they will join their local group and they're okay. going to put up a bat box. So absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much for the talk and answering the questions. They're in Reading and they, they think they have a good local bat group. And another thank you. And that was great. They will join the London bat group. Um, do we have bats in Meath Gardens now? I've never done a bat walk in Meath Gardens. I've obviously, I have done them along Mile End Park and we get them there. So happy to do one for you. Let's get in touch. I'll do a bat walk for you at Meath Gardens. I'm sure everywhere I do bat, we do bat surveys in Tower Hamlets, I've found bats. I haven't not found bats wherever I get the bat detector out. So, can I, I can I ask one last thing? Go for it, Sally. Sorry, sorry to say it's about me and my garden, but if is one bat box okay, or do you, do you need more than one to kind of encourage is an isolated box any good or? Well, one is better than none always, um, but the, you know, more is also good. So that way you can vary the locations and aspects they're on. But um, you know, if you if you don't have the means to put up one or the space or the money or whatever, then uh, more than one, yeah. one is definitely fine. Um, what I will say is don't be disheartened or dissuaded if bats don't move in straight away. Um, sometimes it, the bat box needs to be up for a good few seasons before bats yeah. will move in they might come nearby and sort of suss it out see if it's suitable um but you know if they've not moved in in the, in the first summer don't worry um hopefully they'll eventually move in <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very much no problem yes, sorry. um another another great from tara great talk hannah and um, jill saying thank you very interesting andy saying thanks it's nice to know bats are still friends in this harsh time and uh, someone very keen to come on a bat walk ASAP and they're in Bethnal Green. So yeah, we're all keen to get out and do things with the public and mix, mix with people like we once did. So it will happen, I'm sure, in time. So we look forward to seeing everyone back in parks doing probably socially distanced walks for quite a while with less people. Um, otherwise, if there's nothing, nothing, no last words from anybody or questions, I'm going to say a massive thank you to Hannah. Um, I really do appreciate you uh, doing the talk and sharing with us your love of bats and all the all, all the interesting facts and knowledge that you have about it so yeah thanks for supporting the friends and so much park online it's been brilliant so um yes we'll give you i'm gonna give you a round of applause thank you hannah thank, thank you. you thanks <laughs> <laughs>